Hi, and welcome back to my videos for Physical Chemistry 1. In the last few videos, we looked at transitions between phases and the way the thermodynamic properties of such a transition can be calculated. We also saw the phase rule, which involves both the number of phases and the number of components in a system. Today, we'll start to talk about a very common situation in which a system will have more than one component, and that's systems that are made of a solution. As you already know, a solution consists of a solvent and one or more solutes, and each of these are a different component of our system. It'll be important for us to know the concentrations of such solutions, so let's quickly review the way that we calculate a concentration. To refresh your memory, the molarity is the moles of solute per liters of solution. That's the unit that chemists like us use the most often, but there are several other concentration units we could use, and they're very useful in certain situations. Today, we'll look at each of those different concentration units and talk about how and when to use them. To start off with, let's do a quick calculation with the unit you already know how to use, the molarity. That way, we'll have something to compare to when we look at the other kinds of units. Suppose we dissolve 35.0 grams of sodium chloride, and you dissolve it in water until you have 700 mils of solution total. What's the molarity of the solution? As we saw earlier, the molarity is the moles of solute over the liters of solution. The liters of solution is easy. We have 700 milliliters, so that's 0 0.700 liters. For the moles of solute, we'll use the periodic table. By now, you should be comfortable using the periodic table to determine the moles of sodium chloride. I'll do it in this example, but this is a step I'm going to skip in future problems. Anyway, we have 35.0 grams of sodium chloride. From the periodic table, we find out that NaCl has a mass of 58.442 grams per mole. We want the grams to cancel, so it goes in the denominator, and the one mole goes up top. That gives us 0 0.599 moles of NaCl. So we plug that into our formula for molarity, and we find out that we have a 0 0.856 molar solution. Remember, the symbol for molarity is a capital M, not lowercase. That'll be important later in this video. Now, let's look at some other concentration units. One of these is the molality. The molality is similar to the molarity, but with two important differences. The molality is the moles of solute over the kilograms of solvent. So, the numerator is the same as in the molarity, but the denominator is different in two ways. First, it's in kilograms. But second, it's kilograms of the solvent only, not the whole solution. I really want to stress that because it's a common mistake that people make. If you use the kilograms of solution, you will get an incorrect molality. So let's try to determine the molality of the NaCl solution we used in the previous example. Again, we have 35.0 grams of sodium chloride and 700 mils of total solution. We do need one additional piece of information in order to solve this problem, which is this. The density of the solution is 1.03 grams per milliliter. So let's solve this one. The molality is moles of solute over kilograms of solvent. We already calculated the moles of NaCl back when we were working on the molarity. It's 0 0.599 moles. To get the kilograms of solvent, we'll need to use the density. As you know, density is equal to the mass of a solution divided by its volume. If you've forgotten that, you might want to look at the very first video of General Chemistry 1, where we talked about the density. Anyway, the density is 1.03 grams per milliliter, and the volume is 700 milliliters. We can use this to find the mass of the solution, which is 721 grams. Now, what we want in the denominator is the mass of the solvent, not the mass of the solution, which is what we just calculated. The solution is made up of the solvent and solute. So to get the mass of the solvent only, we need to subtract the mass of the NaCl from the mass of the solution. So we subtract 35.0 grams of NaCl 
from the 721 grams of solution. That leaves us with 686 grams of solvent. We want the kilograms of solvent, so that's 0.686 kilograms. We use that in the formula for molality, which gives us a molality of 0.873. The symbol for molality is a lowercase m. Make sure you don't use a capital M, which is the symbol for molarity. Using the wrong unit for molality or molarity is worth points on your homework and tests. So, we've seen two different concentration units, molarity and molality. Let's look at another one. One useful new unit is the mole fraction, which has the symbol X. When we have more than one ingredient in a solution, the mole fraction for a particular component is the moles of that ingredient divided by the total moles for all the components. Let's try finding the mole fraction for each of the components in our NaCl solution. We have two different ingredients, the water and the NaCl. The mole fraction of each is the moles of the ingredient over the total moles of everything. So, for the mole fraction of water, first we need to know the moles of water. When we were working on the molality, we figured out that we have 686 grams of water. We can use the periodic table to find out the moles, and it turns out to be 38.1 moles of water. So, the mole fraction of water is the moles of water, 38.1, divided by the moles of water plus NaCl. That gives us a mole fraction of 0.985 for the water. Notice that the units all canceled out, so the mole fraction actually doesn't have a unit. So we've calculated the mole fraction of water, so now let's do it for the NaCl. That's the moles of NaCl divided by the moles of all the ingredients. So it's 0.599 moles over the sum of the moles of NaCl and water. That gives us a mole fraction of 0.0155 for the NaCl. Notice that the mole fractions of all the ingredients add up to give us 1. That should always be true. The mole fractions for all ingredients in a solution always should total 1. So now we're up to three different ways of measuring the concentration. Molarity, molality, and mole fraction. Let's learn a few more. Three concentration units that are very similar to each other are the mass percentage, the parts per million, and the parts per billion. We calculate each of these by dividing the mass of the ingredient we're interested in by the total mass of all the ingredients. We then multiply it by 100 for the mass percentage, by a million for the parts per million, or by a billion for the parts per billion. Let's try it for the ingredients in our salt water solution. For the NaCl, we have 35.0 grams on top, and in the bottom, we have the mass of the NaCl plus the water. For the percent by mass, that gives us 4.85%. For the parts per million, we get 48,500 ppm. And for the parts per billion, we get 48,500,000 ppb. Meanwhile, for the water, we have 686 grams of water on top and the total mass on the bottom. That gives us 95.1%, 951,000 ppm, and 951 million ppb. Notice that the percent by mass for the NaCl and the water add up to give us a total of 100%. Since our solution only contains NaCl and water, it makes sense that the two of them together total 100%. So, these are all the concentration units that we've learned. Molarity, molality, mole fraction, percent by mass, parts per million, and parts per billion. Let's try one more example. This time, we'll start with one concentration unit and we'll convert it into the other units. You might know that in the United States, Coca-Cola contains high fructose corn syrup to make it sweet. However, in some other countries, Coke actually contains cane sugar, also known as sucrose, which has a formula C12 
H22 O11. This kind of coke has a density of 1.05 grams per milliliter, and the sucrose in it has a molarity of 0 0.306 molar. Now that we know that, let's figure out the molality, the mole fraction, and the mass percentage of the sucrose in coke. We'll try the molality first. Coca-Cola is almost entirely made of sugar and water. The flavoring and coloring and other ingredients are only a tiny amount of what's in coke. So we'll just pretend that sucrose and water are the only two ingredients. The molarity tells us that there are 0.306 moles of sucrose in every liter of solution. So for the molality, we need to know the moles of sucrose and the kilograms of solvent, which is water. So the first thing we need is the moles of sucrose. We can get that using the molarity we're given. The concentration of our coke is the same no matter what size sample we take, so we can choose to have our sample be any size we want. Since the molarity has units of moles per liter, it makes sense to imagine that we take a sample of coke that has a volume of one liter. If we do that, the molarity tells us that we have 0 0.306 moles of sucrose. Some of you might be a little concerned that I just arbitrarily decided to pretend that the sample of coke we have has a volume of one liter. Actually, we could have chosen any volume at all. Instead of one liter, we could have chosen to have our sample size be 10,000 liters, or just two milliliters, or any volume you could imagine in between. Since the concentration is the same, no matter how large or small our sample is, we'd get the same answer when we eventually finish the problem. So, then why did I pick one liter for the volume? I only did that because it made it easy to calculate the moles of sucrose. If we have one liter of a 0 0.306 molar solution, that means we must have 0 0.306 moles of solute. If we had chosen a different volume, we'd still be able to solve the problem, but the calculation would be a little bit harder. Notice that I only chose one liter as the sample size because we were given the concentration in molarity, where the denominator is one liter of solution. If we'd been given the molality instead, I would have chosen a different sample size. In that case, I would have chosen to have the sample size be just right so that we'd have one kilogram of solvent, because that would make it easy to figure out the moles of solute. And if we had been given the mole fraction of one of the ingredients, I would again have chosen our sample size to be different. I would have chosen it to be just the right size so that the total number of moles was one. That would make it really easy to figure out the number of moles of the ingredient. Notice that in each of these examples, I chose a sample size that would give me a one in the denominator that will always make our calculations a little easier. Here's one last example. If we were given the mass percentage of one of the components, I would pretend that our sample was just the right size to weigh a total of 100 grams. That way, it would be really easy to calculate the mass of the component. Anyway, back to the Coke. We've decided that we have 1.00 liters of Coke which means we have 0 0.306 moles of sucrose. To finish calculating the molality, we need to know the kilograms of solvent. We'll start by using the density to figure out the mass of the solution. The density is 1.05 grams per milliliter, which is the mass divided by the volume. We know the volume is one liter. Don't forget to change the volume into milliliters since that's what the density is using. So, our mass turns out to be 1,050 grams. But wait, that's not what goes in the denominator of our equation. We need the kilograms of solvent, which is water. But the 1,050 grams is the mass of the whole solution. To get the mass of the solvent, we need to subtract the mass of the sucrose. To do that, we'll use the periodic table we have 0 0.306 moles of sucrose. And from the periodic table, we find out that a mole of sucrose weighs 342.2943 grams. That gives us a mass of 105 grams for the sucrose. 
So the mass of the solvent is 1050 grams minus 105, or 945 grams. We convert that into kilograms and then put it in our formula for molality, which finally gives us a molality of 0.325 m. Remember to use a lowercase m here. Next, let's figure out the mole fraction of sucrose. We need the moles of sucrose on top and the total moles in the denominator. We've already figured out the moles of sucrose. It's 0.306. To get the total moles, we just need to know the moles of water. Just a few minutes ago, we figured out that there are 945 grams of water, so we can figure out how many moles this is by using the periodic table. When we do, we find out that we have 52.5 moles of water. We'll plug that into our formula, and we find out that the mole fraction of sucrose is 0 0.00580. Remember, the mole fraction doesn't have units. Finally, let's figure out the mass percentage of sucrose. This one will be easy. We already figured out that we have 105 grams of sucrose. And in the denominator, we'll put the total mass of the sucrose and the water. We multiply that by 100, which gives us a result of 10.0%. So our bottle of Coke is 10% sugar by mass. That's a lot of sugar. Now that we've talked about concentration units, let's delve more deeply into what happens when a solute and solvent interact. For now, we'll just look at binary solutions, that is, solutions that consist of just one solute and one solvent. Also, for now, we'll just look at solutions where the solute and solvent are both liquids. Suppose we have a solution consisting of two liquids, liquid A and liquid B. We'd like to determine the Gibbs free energy of this solution. As we saw back in video 29, we can calculate the Gibbs free energy by taking the total derivative. To take the total derivative, we'll take the partial derivatives with respect to the independent variables of the system. In this case, those are the pressure, temperature, and the number of moles of each component of the system. Those partial derivatives might seem familiar to you. We've actually seen all of them in previous videos. The first one is equal to the volume. The next is equal to the negative of the entropy. And the last two are the chemical potentials of liquids A and B. As we've mentioned before, it's very common to hold the pressure constant during an experiment. For example, that's what happens whenever we conduct an experiment in an open container, like a beaker. But if the pressure is constant, that means that dP is equal to zero, and the first term drops out. If the system we're performing is also an isothermal process, then dt is also zero, so that term drops out too. That leaves us with this equation. If we're looking at non-infinitesimal changes, we can change dg into delta g, which gives us this. You might remember that the chemical potential is the same thing as the molar Gibbs free energy. So, we can rewrite the equation this way. It turns out we can write similar equations for most properties of a solution. For example, if we look at the volume of a system instead of its Gibbs free energy, we can write this expression. This might not seem like an unusual result, but it actually does give us some unexpected results in our experiments. For example, suppose the two components of our solution are ethanol and water. Here's the equation we'd get. But the reason this is such a surprising result is that V bar, the molar volume for each component, is different depending on the relative amounts of water and ethanol. Here's how that works. This is a plot of the molar volumes of ethanol and water with the mole fraction of ethanol on the x-axis. As you can see, when the mole fraction of ethanol is zero, that is, when the solution is only water, then the water has a molar volume of about 18.0 milliliters. However, the molar volume decreases somewhat as the mole fraction of ethanol increases. As you can see, when the amount of ethanol increases to nearly 100%, the molar volume of the water is almost as low as 5 milliliters. 
A similar decrease in the molar volume of ethanol also occurs as the amount of ethanol increases. The reason for this is the shapes of the molecules and the ways the molecules orient themselves because of their intermolecular interactions. For example, molecules of pure water tend to form a regular pattern like this. In this orientation, the hydrogen atoms of each molecule are close to the oxygen atom in an adjacent molecule, which allows the two molecules to strongly hydrogen bond. However, as you can tell, this pattern causes large hexagonal gaps between the molecules, so there's lots of empty space in this group of molecules. However, when ethanol molecules are added to water, the ethanol disrupts this pattern, and the resulting mixture of water and ethanol molecules don't contain as many empty spaces. So the volume occupied by a mole of water is lower than when only water molecules are present. So let's see how we can use this equation to predict the volume of a mixture of ethanol and water. Suppose we have 250 milliliters of ethanol and 250 milliliters of water, and we combine them. What will be the volume of the resulting solution? We'll use this equation to solve the problem. To do that, we'll need to know the moles of each compound. To get the moles, we'll need to know the mass of each compound. But right now, all we have is the volume. So to get masses from that, we'll need to know the density of water and the density of ethanol. If we look those up, we find out that the density of water is 0.9982 grams per milliliter, and the density of ethanol is 0.7983 grams per milliliter. We can use the definition of density for each of these compounds in order to find the masses. For water, we can solve this equation to find out that the mass of water is 249.55 grams. And for ethanol, we get 199.575 grams. Now we can use the periodic table to get the moles of each of those compounds. It turns out we have 13.85 moles of water and 4.332 moles of ethanol. So we can plug both of those values into our equation for the overall volume of the solution. To get the molar volume of each component, we'll use this plot. Remember, this shows us the molar volume of each component based on the mole fraction of ethanol. So in order to use the plot, we need to know the mole fraction. We get that by dividing the moles of ethanol by the total moles. Since we've already calculated the moles of each component, we can plug those into our formula, which then tells us that the mole fraction of ethanol is 0.238. If we use that value, we can see on this plot that the molar volume of water is 15.75 milliliters per mole. And for ethanol, it's 61.90 milliliters per mole. Now we can finally plug those into our equation for the overall volume. And we find that the volume of the solution is 486.34 milliliters. And now you can see why this is actually a very surprising result. We combine 250 milliliters of water and 250 of ethanol, and the volume of the resulting solution is actually 2.7% lower than the sum of the components. Again, this is because of the way the molecules fit together when they're combined into a solution. This difference between the volumes of the individual components and of the solution is large enough to be very easy to observe in the lab. For example, here's the combination that we just talked about. In this volumetric flask, I'll put 250 milliliters of pure water. And in this volumetric flask, I'll pour 250 milliliters of pure ethanol. Now that we have those, I'll combine them into this 500 milliliter volumetric flask. If the volumes were simply added together, of course you would get 500 milliliters. However, as you can see, when they're combined, the volume is actually well under 500 mils. 
According to the problem we just solved, the volume we get should be 486.34 mils. Let's see if that's actually what we've got. As you can see, the volume we got is very close to what we predicted, although it might be a little bit different because of impurities in the two liquids that we started with. Well, that's enough new material for now. When we meet again, we'll look at more properties of solutions, including the way solutions of gases dissolved in liquids behave. That has lots of applications, including in carbonated beverages and in scuba gear. I hope you'll join me for that. But until next time, have a good week.